This is downtown Portland, Sixth and Alder, if I remember right, the transit realignment project where they were trying to put the the Macs and the buses and the and the the, the streetcars uh, one central kind of location thing, I think. Uh, anyway, lots of traffic, lots of people out there, and they had to protect the pedestrians and vehicles from material that could be thrown from this machine. And this is a heavy hammer, and it hammers the ground, it throws debris. So they had one gentleman stand over here on the side, and his job was to hold a plywood panel so that any debris that was created wouldn't throw up into the pedestrians walking on the sidewalk. And, whoops. This gentleman was holding a panel. To keep debris from going out into the street. They're working along. Interestingly enough, as they're, as they're working, they notice that this thing is making a lot of noise. So the guys on the ground say, hey, 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 operator, stop for a minute. Let's look this thing over. It doesn't seem to be working quite right. Making a lot of noise. So they stopped the work. They all went up and they inspected it. And they looked at it and realized, you know, this thing's pretty worn out. I think it's just, they, they decided to just it's just worn out, and that's why it was making all that noise. They went back to work. A little while later, oops. In real life, this thing weighed th about 3,000 pounds, about the weight of a small car. And it didn't just drop off of there like it did off my machine. It, it was hammering. It jumped. Jeff didn't stand a chance. It landed right on him. They took him up to OHSU, but uh, he died in the ER. So what went wrong? You know. When I investigate these accidents, one of the most important tools that I have in doing my work is the owner-operator manual for the equipment involved. There is so much good information in an owner-operator manual. It's, it co covers dangers and warnings and all that. So I go to this equipment, and now there's a picture of it uh, standing on the on the hoe. Here's a picture of what the actual scene looked like when I got there. This is the blue hammer laying here. Here's Jeff's hard hat. Here's the panel that he was holding. And this is just laying on the ground next to the excavator. I go and I look at it and it's like, okay, it looks like that came off from this quick coupler. And I look at the quick coupler and it's a Jones model quick coupler. Now you have whatever, this happened to be a tap tachi hoe, I think, but you can put whatever equipment you want on it. This one had the Jones quick coupler attachment, and the Jones quick coupler attachment has its own owner operator manual. Uh, of course, they didn't have it in the equipment, they didn't have it with them, but I go back to the office and Google's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I Google it on my computer, up comes Jones Equipment Manufacturing. And I quick, I a quick coupler, and it shows me a picture of their quick coupler. And all the information that I want about that quick coupler is right there. And then it was interesting, 
It's also made right here in Portland. Well, actually, Gresham area. Uh, and so I called up Gordon Jones, the owner of the company, and uh, I went out there, met with him, and I got a lesson on quick couplers. He, uh, he in fact, uh, before he, we were done, he gave me a drawing, a scale drawing of his quick coupler, and, uh, and I made a model for training purposes. And the, the quick coupler's pretty straightforward. It has a wedge that moves in and out. And let me open it up. This piece is permanently mounted to the top of the, uh, of the breaker or the bucket or whatever it is that you've got uh, that you, you want to be quick changed. And this is permanently attached to the boom in two places, like so, so that it'll move up and down with the boom. Now, I, this has originally should have had a metal cover over the workings. I made mine out of plastic so you can see what's the workings, what's going on inside of there. But there's a hydraulic cylinder that activates this wedge and not by a push button like what I'm doing, but by hydraulic hoses. And in the cab, the operator can flip a switch and it causes this wedge to move in and out. Make sense? So the operator, all he has to do is to take this on the boom, swing it into position here, drop it down into these tabs, and then open this wedge drop it down and then let the wedge close and it's locked in place. Make sense? Um, the thing I learned from Gordon Jones and, and his manual is this quick coupler originally has a safety bolt. And that safety bolt goes right in here to prevent inadvertent activation of the wedge. Nobody knew that it had a safety bolt. They'd never seen the manual. Um, when I met with Gordon that first day, it was interesting because there's a lot of these out there. He was sold out of safety bolts. Everybody in town heard about it. Now, they just inspected the machine. If they'd have known about the safety bolt, Jeff wouldn't have lost his life. They could have put the safety bolt in and went back to work. Yeah, there was other problems. In fact, as we brought the, the equipment in to Jones Equipment Manufacturing, and uh, If you look at, this is the actual quick coupler device. You can see, here's the wedge, the, here's the bolt where the safety bolt goes, the hole where the safety bolt goes, and there's, there, you could put two in. The manufacturer only requires that one be installed, uh, depending on the, how much weight you're hauling, you're lifting or, or moving around. Uh, but you'll notice that also, right here, the, the, you can't see back in here very well. I didn't get a very good picture of that. But the hydraulic cylinder sits here, and this is the, the, the shaft from the cylinder. And on the end of it, it's actually the nut is missing, and the, the end of that is just bent over, holding the thing in place. Uh, and you notice that cover is missing. Well, by be, having that cover missing, it gets all kinds of dirt and crap in there and it causes premature wear on the equipment. In fact, those springs that help hold this in a closed position were loose and worn. They were rattling in there. And 
Uh, it was interesting, when I got the cover, the original cover for the unit, it has a danger sticker on it. And that danger sticker warns to install the safety bolt. Now, I'll mention again OSHA rules. Now, I won't get specific about it. But the rules say that if you have a piece of equipment and you have a danger warning sticker that wears off or gets, gets rubbed off or damaged, you have to replace it. And if you look at the equipment manufacturer's manual for the Traco, for the Jones Quick Coupler, whatever, they all have a manual and they all tell you where those stickers are. And you can order them from the company. It's important to keep the danger warning stickers on to help people recognize the hazards. Oh, the next one, this is a, over in the Troutdale area. And they're putting in a subdivision. The owner of the company, this small company, he got a couple employees. Uh, does, does, just does a, a, a pretty small amount of work. He was going to do this subdivision, uh, and he needed some help. So he went to a friend of his, and his friend's son was like, needed a job, and, and hadn't worked construction before, but he was willing to try. And it's like, okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put you on. We got, we got you know, summer's work here, so let's go for it. And... Uh, he knew he was going to be deep. He knew that this sewer system going into this new subdivision was going to be 20, 25 feet deep. In this case, it's about 21 feet deep. The area had been previously disturbed. Uh, it had been farmed or whatever they were doing there. Uh, but if you will for a minute, pretend that, that this is our manhole. Shield. They're getting ready to put a manhole in. Now, because it's 20 feet deep, or 21, they actually have two shields. There's a lower one here, and then another one on top, and they're bolted together. And a, my understanding uh, from the uh, manufacturer of the shield is the, the two of them bolted together weigh about 14,000 pounds. Very, very heavy. So the first thing they do is they dig the trench out. They're, they're, they're laying pipe as they go. You can see there's a trench shield in the, in the hole in, in, before you get to the area where the incident occurred. Uh, now this, has, this thing has holes on two sides. The hole on this side is, I cut out so you can see what's going on in there, uh, but normally that would be closed. Uh, in this case, they're, they, first thing they do, they, they know what the grade is or where they have to set the pipe. So they go in, they dump rock in there, and they, then they send the man down in the hole. And obviously, they got to have a ladder. Got to have a ladder when somebody's in the hole so they can get out. And the first thing they do is they go in there. And they grade the rock down, or they, they, they grade the rock out to the depth that it needs to be. And then they go in and set the first manhole section. Now pretend for a minute that this is a manhole section. And uh, if you will, they've got a chain or wire rope or whatever they're using to, to rig it to set it down into the ground. But it's got a bottom. And it's usually got at least two holes in it where pipes come in and go out. And then they'll take this piece, set it in the ground, and then they take another piece and stack it on top and stack it up until they get to the height that they need. That makes sense? So they bring this in and they set it in the hole. And the next thing they got to do is simply bring it up. I know what I'll do.
Oh, I'm acting like an operator now. Oh. Um, they bring it up, set it in the hole, and then all they need to do is pick the thing up an inch or two off of the bottom and then have the employee turn the concrete ring until the holes line up and then set it back down. That makes sense? So they pick it up just a couple inches off of the bottom. And just as they do that, a cave-in occurs between the track hole and this side of the shield. Now, I was really surprised. But they tell you that a, a, a cubic foot of dirt weighs about 100 pounds, very heavy. And, and this material broke off of there, and through these holes that are in this to, to put pipe in, it flowed inside of that manhole shield, and it knocked him down to the ground and covered his legs, the lower portion of his legs. Now, the top guy tells me he was, he was struggling. He was down, pinned up on his legs, and he was struggling, trying to get up. When, when, you know, what happens after the first cave-in? A second cave-in. The second cave-in occurred. And I was really surprised. The, the top guy told me that second cave-in hit that box so hard that it, that it hit it into the wire rope or to the chain, hit like this, and it started It started this thing swinging around like a gong and a bell inside of that shield. He's pinned down. Eventually, he was crushed between the wall of the shield and the swinging concrete ring. Now, you know, so I can't tell you how devastating some of these things are. I get out to that accident scene, and I remember the, over in the corner, the owner of the company just sitting there on a pile of rock crying. And all he could say was, what am I going to tell my friend? Um, you know, I, I have a job to do, and... I've got to cut through all that and get to the work. And the, I have to ask him, OK, I look at the scene. I figure out what's going on. And I'm like, OK, what's the owner-operator manual for a, a manhole shield? Anybody know? Anybody do excavation work? Tab data sheet? It's in the rules. Any manufactured shoring system has to have engineering data to tell you how to safely and properly use it. So I go to the owner, I said, where's the tab data on the shield? He's like, huh? I, I rented it from the rental place down the street. OK, where's your rental agreement? He went in the pickup, and about three pages in, here's the tab data sheet. And certainly, right there, the size of the excavation shall be cut vertical and narrow to prevent lateral movement of the manhole shield. If necessary, backfill around the shield to a height sufficient to prevent lateral movement. So essentially, it's got to be tight in the hole. Does that look like it's tight in the hole? Now, and, and, and that prevents it from moving around in there. If you keep it tight, and if you have to, backfill around it. I'm, I'm like, OK, here's the instructions. Uh, why is there so much room around the, sh the shield? And you know what he told me? Well, I, I don't want to make it any bigger than we have to, but every time I dig out, it kept caving in. And he just assumed that the 14,000-pound box was sufficient to provide for safety without looking at the 
owner operator manual for the equipment that he was using. Um, and I, I, I really questioned it. I, I, I thought, man, that's really moving a big, heavy metal shield like that. But we were on the, I, well, we were, I had another guy with me. We were on the site for a couple of days. And uh, during the second day, uh, I was sitting there, and it was still in the same position, and another cave-in occurred, and it did. It hit that box and knocked it around in there like it was a toy. And you can see if you, well, if you looked at the ground, you can't see real well here, but there are cracks all over the place, and the ground was caving in. It was unsafe. It needed to be backfilled around. And a lot of times they don't backfill around because it makes it harder to get out of the hole. Okay. So much for that. This next one, this was a Happy Valley area. If any of you get over there, you know how much construction has been going on over there. And they're, they're about 16 feet deep here. This is a picture when I got to the job site. And uh, uh, what they're doing is putting in sewer line and as they, they dig the hole out, now this bucket isn't much wider than the, the shield itself. I mean, they keep it pretty tight in the hole. Uh, and they, as they dig it out, they lay the pipe within the shield, and then they advance the shield in the hole. Now, our rules don't specifically say they can, they have, they, they don't, that the man can't stay in the hole when they advance the shield, as a matter of fact, it, 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 our rules don't, do, do allow it, but the rules do say they have to be protected for all, from all hazards <coughs> at all times. So they're in the hole, and um, they got a ladder in the hole while he's doing his work. Got to have a ladder at all times. They get ready to pull the thing. Now, in this case, I'm using a bungee cord, uh, but let me suggest to you, especially if you've ever done it, that uh, a 16,000 pound uh, shield tight in the hole using a wire rope is much like a bungee cord. You're using a bungee cord, or not a bungee cord, a wire rope, and they hook it. to the bucket, and now they remove the ladder. Now, why does he stay in the hole? Typically what they tell me is they'll, they'll, he'll stay in the hole, they put the pipe in the hole, and then they put the rock on top of it, and then when they pull this shield, the rock tends to want to pull on that pipe, and it may try to pull it out from the fitting behind it, outside of the shield area. So the guy in the hole will stand there, and he'll put a shovel in the ground in front of the pipe opening to keep it so it won't pull. Does that make sense? Tim? Oh. Tim would notice that. He's seen this before. Uh, so he's in the hole. They're going to advance the box. Now they come in here and it's like, okay, they take the ladder out of the hole because if they use the ladder, it's going to fall over and it could get damaged. That's a violation. You've got to have safe access and egress at all times. They pull the ladder and they're getting ready to advance it. And they start the process.
Now, in real life, this hook and shackle weighed 31 pounds. It hit Davy right in the back of the head. He didn't stand a chance. He was wearing a hard hat. That didn't help at all. So what went wrong? I get out to the accident scene, and you can see, maybe you can't, this uh, hook here is the, the latch on the hook is sprung completely out. That tells me that the hook has been loaded in the top of the hook instead of down in the, in the belly of the hook where it should be loaded, and, and obviously fracture the latch, which isn't a lifting device or loading device, and the whole thing came out. Uh, so I looked at that, and I thought, okay, that's a hook on a bucket. And the superintendent was quick to point out, no, that hook's not on the bucket, that's on the quick coupler. And in fact, he said, yeah, it's, the bucket's separate, that's a, that's a Hendrix quick coupler. Oh, okay, so I go online, I Google Hendrix quick coupler, and this is the picture on the front of the owner-operator manual. You can see that has a closed loop eye. It does not have a gun and bow UKN 10 latch type hook, like what's on this piece of equipment. So I called the company, the manufacturer, they're like, no, absolutely not, because you don't know, on a, on a boom like that, you don't know what position that could be in. It could be in the wrong position and cause this kind of an accident. So. Uh, they tell me they never did it. So I go back to the owner operator or the owner of the company. I'm like, uh, okay, what's going on here? And they said they put that on there about a year ago. Because when you hook uh, that closed loop eye and you use this thing and it gets digging in any holes, they have a heck of a time getting that apart. And they found that this latch type hook just works great. They, and it goes on easy and it comes off easy. He said, yeah, we do wear them out because they are still on there and they're digging. In fact, he told me that one that's on there is only two weeks old. They keep extras in the shop because it works so well. Well, if you look at the first page, second page, if, if you will, on the owner-operator manual, it tells, talks about unauthorized modifications of the equipment and the potential for somebody getting killed as a result. Um, you know, I, I, I interviewed the operator on this piece of equipment and I asked him, well, how, how do you know what angle that hook's at? And he says, I don't. I rely on my top guy. I, I went and I interviewed the top guy. You know what he told me? I ain't standing there. I've seen these things fail. Red flags? <laughs>